edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, celebrating 55 years of ministry. I started watching Andrew. Everything that he said had a witness within my spirit, and he made the word come alive. You know, he just helped me connect dots. I have such a passion and a love for the word of God, and he deepened that for me. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing a series that I started nearly two weeks ago talking about what I call spirit, soul, and body, talking about how it's your spirit that got changed and your identity in Christ, and I'm giving this book away. And I tell you this, I, I've said this every day, but this is what changed my life. This is the foundation of everything that God has taught me, and uh, I want you to have this teaching. That's the reason we're giving it away. We also have CDs, DVDs, a USB, an audio book. We have a, an illustrated version of this where it's animated, and we've just got so many ways for you to get this. And remember, this is our gift to you, and please take advantage of it. I've already covered so much material, I just can't go back through it. Just the last couple of days, I've been in Hebrews chapter 9, and I want to go back to this verse. I used this on the program yesterday, but Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12 says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And I was making the point that Jesus died for our sins and only applied his blood to our sins once, once, which is contrary to what the vast majority of the body of Christ believes. The body of Christ as a whole believes that when you came to the Lord and asked God for salvation, believed on Jesus, that your sins up until that time were forgiven, but all of your future sins have to be dealt with individually and put under the blood and that that blood has to be reapplied. But this says he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Verse 15 says at the last part of that verse, it says they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Most people believe it's temporary inheritance only good until the next time you sin and then you lose it and you got to get back into the good favor of God. I dealt with all of those things yesterday. I need to go on from here, but when you came to the Lord, He didn't just forgive your sins up until that point. He forgave all of the sins that you would ever commit in your entire life. So that is liberating, and at the same time, there are some people that just hate that because they think that I'm encouraging sin. I can't tell you everything I know in one program. I am not encouraging sin. And let me just say it this way, that, you know, if I was living a sinful life, if I had a hidden life where I had mistresses on the side, where I was stealing money, where I was just, you know... Uh, opening my arms and embracing sin. And then if I was preaching this, I think that I would be open to a lot of criticism. But I guarantee you, you can't criticize me over taking these truths that I'm sharing with you and this causes me to go live in sin. I live a holier life than most of you probably think about. And I'm not saying that in a bragging sense. I'm just saying it that what I'm teaching here and understanding the love that God has for us and the degree to which he saved us and the amount of grace, it has taught me to live a holy life. I haven't used this as an occasion to go live in sin. So those of you who have a fear that what I'm saying is just going to turn people loose to sin, that's because the only way that you have ever served God is out of a fear that he's going to reject you. I don't have a fear that he's going to reject me. On the, on the other hand, I have so much love and thankfulness for what God has done in my life that love is compelling me to live holier and seek God more than fear ever did. Fear will cause you to do just enough to, you know, satisfy that fear, to take care of that fear and to get it out of the way. But love, man, once you understand the love that God has for you, there is no limit to it. It'll cause you to serve God with everything you've got. So in this ninth chapter, there's either four or five times that he talks about and emphasizes that Jesus only dealt with your sins once. 
He doesn't deal with every time you sin, you got to go to the Lord and get it forgiven all over again, get born again again. No, there's only one born again, and then you, you just are born again. You don't have to get born again again. You don't get saved, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost, depending on your performance. It says down here in Hebrews chapter 9, and in verse 20, it says, saying, this is the blood of the testament. This is talking about Jesus and what he did. This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. Talking about the Old Testament tabernacle and, and temple. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figure of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once... In the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Again, if you are tracking with this, which I don't have time to go back and put all of this in its proper perspective, but it's showing you a new and living way to have a relationship with God, separate from the way it was done in the Old Covenant. In the Old Covenant, they offered blood sacrifices all of the time. There was a day of atonement that atoned for all of the sins of the people. But then every time you sinned, you had to bring a blood sacrifice. Every time there was a new moon, you had to bring a blood sacrifice. Every time you had a child, you had to have a blood sacrifice. There was just constant shedding of blood. I just read yesterday about at the dedication of the temple that Solomon offered something like, I think it was 40 or 60,000 oxen. 60,000 and 120,000 lambs. All of those sacrifices were offered. Man, can you even imagine slaying that many animals in one day? Today, we don't do that. You know why? Because Jesus obtained relationship for us with God once and for all. That's what he's saying. He's saying if he had to offer a sacrifice every time there was a sin then he would just be constantly offering a sacrifice. And this is the reason that in the Old Testament, they offered sacrifices over and over because the blood of bulls and of goats could never take away sin. It was only symbolic. But the blood of Jesus took away all of our sin, past, present, and even future sin. So let me go back again to this verse 25, and it says, Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation." So that's at least four times in that one chapter that it's emphasizing that Jesus dealt with our sins once for all. Not over and over. Not every time you sin, you got to go back to the Lord and somehow or another get back into his good standing. You know, I had a sister. She's now gone to be with the Lord. She was nine years older than me. But my sister Joyce, she loved God. She was a great lady. And um, anyway, she had a daughter one of my nieces that I guarantee you just would, would try anybody's faith. She was a pain, to put it mildly. And my sister was fixing supper, and she had her husband was a professor at the college, and he was bringing home another professor, so she was fixing supper for not only her family, but for this guest that was coming. She was busy doing things. And my niece was in there mouthing off, and she could push your hot button. Boy, she could just get to you. And she's, she's now 50-something years old, and she's still living like that. She's never turned around. But anyway, she was just mouthing off and saying some things. And my sister just hauled off and hit her. 
and knocked her flat of her back. Now, my sister was born again, baptized in the Holy Ghost. She went to uh, the jail every week, led people to the Lord. She loved God. She was seeking God. She knew better what she did was wrong, but she just lost her temper and literally decked her daughter. And boy, when she did, she felt terrible. She ran upstairs. She threw herself across the bed, and she just cried out to God, and she says, Lord, you've got to help me. If I ever start crying about what I did, I won't come out of here until tomorrow morning, and I've got company coming. I've got to go back and finish my meal. And she just cried out for help. And you know what the Lord spoke to her? He said, Joyce, when you were eight years old and you accepted me as your Savior and repented of your sin, and I forgave you of your sin, I forgave you of this sin. He says, it's already dealt with. You're already forgiven. It's, it didn't offend me. He says, I, I dealt with this years and years and years ago. And you know what that did? It broke the dominion of that sin. It didn't make my sister say, well, man, since I'm forgiven, I can go down and slap my daughter around again. No, that's not what happened. She went down and she apologized to her daughter and asked her to forgive her. It didn't encourage her to go live in sin, but it broke the dominion of that sin, knowing that, Jesus, you knew what kind of a person I was when you saved me. You knew that I was going to do this, and you've already forgiven it. And it just broke the dominion of that sin. That's what these things are saying. Jesus dealt with all of our sin, past, present, and even sins that you haven't committed yet. Now, somebody's saying, well, what about 1 John 1, 9? You know what? I need to finish what I'm saying here. I am going to come back to 1 John 1, 9. Let me just real quickly say that that is not talking about getting forgiveness in the sense that it affects your eternal salvation or God's fellowship with you. But if you give Satan a legal inroad into your life through yielding to him in sin, it says that he comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, John 10, 10. It says in Romans chapter 6, verse 16, that when you yield yourself to sin, you, you yield yourself to Satan, the author of that sin, and he produces death in you. So if you have yielded yourself to Satan, how do you get him back out? How do you get rid of this uh, opportunity that he, you gave him into your life? That's when you repent and confess it, not to get your relationship with God, eternal relationship fixed, not to... Uh, restore fellowship, but to stop Satan, to turn on the devil and to repent of it. And then the, the eternal forgiveness that you already have in your spirit. Your spirit is sanctified and perfected forever. I'm going to get to these verses in just a few minutes. That forgiveness that's already in your spirit will come out into your soul and into your body and it will deliver you from the dominion that Satan has in your life. I'll deal with that in more detail later. But let me just continue to read and remember that the chapter and verse divisions in the Bible are there to make it easier for us to reference things. But it doesn't mean that this is a brand new thought and that somehow or another you disconnect from what was said in the ninth chapter. I've just read all of these things about how Jesus entered in once into the holy place and obtained eternal redemption and eternal inheritance for us. And then it says in chapter 10, verse 1, for the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? You know, that's a question. And the answer to this question is yes. If these sacrifices, if the Old Testament animal sacrifices really worked, then once you offered a sacrifice, You'd, you wouldn't offer another sacrifice. But they had to be offered over and over and over because they weren't really atoning for your sin. It was only symbolic of sins being atoned for. You know, the Lord said that the life of the flesh is in the blood. And he also said that in the day you sin, you shall surely die. And so that blood had to be spilt. Under the Old Testament, the Lord, out of His mercy, allowed us to substitute the blood of an animal for our own blood being spilt. Death. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. And so He substituted an animal. But it was only a picture. 
It was only a type, a shadow of something that was going to come. It wasn't the real deal. The real deal is when Jesus came on the scene, the Lamb of God, and John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. And when Jesus died for our sins, the life is in the blood. And when he died and shed his blood for our sins, that was not symbolic. That was the real deal. Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. And as God, his life was so holy and so pure that one drop of his blood was holier and purer than all of the sin and the debauchery of the entire human race. I had somebody one time challenge me when I said that and say, you're saying that he didn't shed all of his blood. He only shed one drop. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that he was so holy and pure, he gave his entire life. He shed all of his blood. He gave his entire life to atone for us. But he was so holy that relative to our unholiness, his blood was so pure that one drop of his blood was holier. It was enough to make atonement for the entire human race. Praise God. So an animal's blood was only symbolic. It didn't actually accomplish anything. But when Jesus gave his life for us, it paid for the sin of the entire world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 says, He is the propitiation for our sin, and not for ours only, but also for the sin of the whole world. When Jesus died, He paid for the sins of the entire world. Somebody's thinking, so is everybody saved? No, because it says you're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourself. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Grace is what Jesus did. That's the shedding of his blood. But you have to accept it by faith. If you believe, you receive. If you doubt, you do without. So Jesus, by grace, provided salvation, but you have to accept it by faith. Not everybody has put faith in God's grace. And so even though their sins have been paid for and atoned for, it doesn't apply to them. It doesn't uh, do any benefit for them until they receive it by grace. If for some reason you're watching this Christian program and you have never made Jesus your personal Lord, you know what you need to do is right now just say, Father, thank you for sending your son for dying for my sins, and I receive that. And if you will put faith in what Jesus did and make him your Lord, that's more than just words, but you literally submit yourself. Doesn't mean you're going to do it perfectly. Doesn't mean that you are promising you'll never sin again because all of your sins have been atoned for, past, present, and future. But if you are willing to just submit yourself and to trust only in Jesus, not your own goodness, but you trust only in Jesus, and you put faith in what he did, then you, you become born again. And so this is saying that if there had been a sacrifice made which could have forgiven sins, wouldn't they have ceased to be offered? And the answer to that is yes. And the answer in the New Covenant is yes. We don't have to go to God and get saved again and again and again, born again and again and again. We don't have to uh, be saved, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost every time we sin. When you come to the Lord, He forgives you of all sin, past, present, and future. So that's what it says in Hebrews 10, 2, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? The answer is yes. And here's the reason, because that the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sin. Once purged, not multiple times purged, not purged many times every day. When Jesus accepted you, he accepted you not only and forgave you of what you had done in the past, but he forgave you of anything you would ever do. Once you get born again, you are created righteous and truly holy, Ephesians 4, 24, 1 John 4, 17, as Jesus says, so are you in this world. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And then when all of those things happened at your salvation, you were immediately vacuum packed, sealed, Ephesians 1, 13, by the Holy Spirit. And that spirit that was created righteous and holy now is still as righteous and holy as it ever was because you were sanctified and perfected forever. Man, that's awesome. 
You know, I know that because of our religious traditions and the way most of us have been brought, that this is just radical and this raises nearly as many questions as it answers. And I'm going to try and keep going through this and dealing with this on our programs. And that's the reason we're offering all of these materials so that you can study this in more detail. And so I know that you may have questions based on what I've said, but I promise you this is liberating if you truly understand that Jesus forgave you of all sin, past, present, and future. And in your spirit, there is no sin. And you don't get contaminated every time you fall short of what you're supposed to be. And God is a spirit, John 4, 24. He is looking at you in the spirit. And if you are going to truly unite with him, worship him, you're going to have to worship him in spirit and in truth. And understanding these truths that I've talked about here just literally set me free. Not free to sin, but free from sin. And again, I'm saying anybody who will criticize me and saying, boy, you're teaching this so you can just go live in sin. You know, Paul said that he spoke sometimes like a lost person, just got down on their level and reasoned with them. He said he wouldn't normally do this, but he says, since you're carnal, I'll just reason with you carnally. Well, in a sense, that's what I'm doing. I, I would never sit there and promote my own goodness because I don't approach God based on my goodness. But anybody who's critical of me and saying that I'm preaching these things just so that I can justify a life of sin, I dare you to come and criticize me. I'm living a holier life than most of you ever thought about. I am not preaching this. This did not cause me to go live a life of sin. Man, I am so thankful for what God has done in my life that, man, I am just spending my life committed to God. You know, yesterday I had the entire day off, and I guess I could have done anything. You know what I did? I spent about 12, I think maybe 10 hours studying the Word. That's what I do. It doesn't cause me to go live in sin. This doesn't cause me to say, man, I'm free so I can go out and do something. Man, I love God so much. I want to know more. I'm trying to understand more. This doesn't free me up to go live in sin. It frees me from the guilt and the condemnation that sin brought into my life. And I'm so thankful that, man, I just, I just want to spend all of the time I've got with the Lord. So I know some of you can't relate to serving God out of love. The only way you serve God is out of fear that you're going to be punished. You're going to be rejected. Somehow or another, God won't use you unless you do all of these things. I'm telling you, there's a better way. You could understand the goodness of God. You could understand the unconditional love of God. And if you ever got a true revelation of that, you'd wind up serving God more accidentally than you ever have on purpose before. I've got all of this in this book, and I encourage you to please get this book. I'm giving it as a gift to you. It's a uh, 200, or no, it's a 160 page book that I wrote many years ago about this, but I promise you this would just explain this better than what I'm able to do in these little 30-minute segments. I have this in English and in Spanish. I also have study guides, DVDs, CDs, USBs, uh, an audio book, and I also have this little illustrated uh, teaching where I'm teaching, but, but there is a illustration uh, being done as I'm teaching. And all of these things are just to help you get hold of this truth. So please listen to our announcer, and please call or write today.